Hi, this is Ed back again with another video for my patrons. Thank you so much for your support. Of course, I'll go into those comments after this. So we're just going into some Sanskrit at the moment, some interesting things. Of course, about a year and a half ago on my Patreon account, I talked about nuclear weapons in the ancient Sanskrit, or at least interpretations of them. You'd have to interpret that for yourselves if that is what has been interpreted or not but I'll go into that a bit later but I'm just going to go into some other strange technologies in the ancient past which might show okay that uh, ancient civilizations had ancient technologies we're not aware of now you've all heard the famous example no doubt if you've watched ancient aliens of the fact when they went into the pyramids okay the inner pyramid itself, right in the middle of the Pyramid of Giza, there weren't actually any hieroglyphics, or at least some of the things looked like they were carved later. But whatever happened in there, there was no uh, carbon found on top of the roof or around that would have been uh, shown to be in places within the chamber caused by torchlight. Now, of course, you could wash that, but you're not. You're going to still find the remnants of that. Okay, you're still going to find the remnants of what happens when a torch burns. So a lot of people are wondering how that is possible. Well, it is possible. I'm not saying I know 100% that maybe the ancients actually had electricity. I know, you think I've gone full ancient aliens here. I have to change my haircut. Okay, no, but there is a lot of interesting things in the past. Now, there's also a lot of hiding of things. I want to add a caveat to this before I go on. Remember the antiquities minister of Egypt? He was arrested for fraud, for selling antiques. Okay. Now, he was reinstated after pressure from the United States and Europe in order to install him again. So, it would be very easy in order to control the flow of information, obviously, only the elected officials at the top of the pyramid are allowed access and exploratory ability to look at these surroundings. Now, I'm not saying you'd open it up to every Tom, Dick and Harry, so to speak. You'd have people out there in tents and walking all over the ground. But you could definitely open it up to actual other researchers that are serious. So let's just really have a look at some classic examples here. And I'll come back to this uh, in regards to the some of the Sanskrit writings about the what could be depicted as an ancient nuclear weapon. And this was from the Mahabharat. Okay, and I actually had to go look up as how to pronounce that. I am aware of it. It's just that I can never remember how to pronounce it itself. So there's a great post here. Okay, and this post is on Event Chronicle, where they try to go through what are some examples from the past of perhaps technology. Now you've all heard about the Baghdad battery. You've all heard about the Ark of the Covenant from the Bible and how its dimensions when it's built actually could, some researchers say, produce electricity. You know, you've heard about these things from the past. I'm not going to go too far into those. I'm going to skip those examples, obviously, because they are so, you know, they've been said over and over again. It's like every second episode or every episode of Ancient Aliens that goes back to the Baghdad battery. But in the meantime, this is one of the most well, well-known examples, so I guess we will cover it still. But let's uh, have a look at this here. So, this isn't the first account of these batteries being found, by the way, or things that could produce electricity. Wine jars with copper uh, things inside them, you know, stuff like that, vinegar jars, which would maybe produce some kind of static charge or electricity. Here is an example here. So this is in regards to the Baghdad battery, which I guess we'll cover fairly quickly. Okay, after World War II, the General Electric Company made a duplicate of the 2,000-year-old battery. This was one of the. This is the bat known as the Baghdad battery itself, which was a certified historical object that was found, fitting it with copper sulfate instead of the unknown original electrolyte, which had evaporated. What is the electrolyte? Uh, well, you you know something that uh, can conduct electricity. Uh, your your body is actually an electrical being. So if you sweat a lot, if you've got a lot of exercise, you've been in the sun, you have to replace your electrolytes. And one source of that might be a 
for instance, a glass of hot water with some salt in it. Okay, that's a pretty poor example, but there would be a conductive element to that itself. So original, it's about your body being enabled to have the minerals and things to enable it to con continue electrical activity. Unknown original electrolyte had been replaced in the Baghdad battery, which had evaporated. The sister battery of ancient Babylonian vase shaped was a vase shaped cell was tested and it worked. It created a charge. This was conclusive proof that the Babylonians did indeed use electricity. Inasmuch as a number of electroplated articles or electroplated etc have been excavated in the same area. So to electroplate something consists of running an electrical charge okay and then what you have is you have your you know ground up silver or whatever and it's attracted to the object and it kind of like ties together but you need a you know two plates something like chrome plate something or you know obviously they didn't have chrome but what i mean is you know to plate something with gold or things like that you know it would have been useful to have this kind of electro uh, plating ability now you have the Baghdad uh, battery, you have evidence showing electroplated uh, things in the vicinity perhaps. They always say they've been excavated, but you have to double check every single thing that's said. But they had sophisticated things. And there is a battery and it was tested by General Electric and it did work. So similar jars have been found in the remains of the Magi's hut. And it has been summarized that both priests and craftsmen kept the knowledge of ancient electro electricity as a trade secret. This always happens with the consolidation and of knowledge and secret societies. They always keep things as a secret. Modern day equivalent now is Majestic 12. In ancient Egypt, you had the uh, Unknown Nine, so to speak. Now, obviously, the Unknown Nine is a bit of a myth. I didn't even know if it's real. <laughs> okay, it says the first examples of it were from uh, you know an adventure story. So I don't know if the originating secret society, you know, as um, you know of India, the Unknown Nine. I'll go into that a bit later if you're interested in it. Maybe I'll just touch on the Unknown Nine for a little bit. Uh, but the equivalent of people that come together in conspiracy in order to hide information and benefit from that information's gains. Seeing that right now with the intelligence sector, right now, okay, with the military industrial complex, but on a far exaggerated scale than the Magi or group of priests from back in the days of Babylonia, okay, you're seeing the exaggerated examples of that. Still happening today, of course. So the presence of the batteries in ancient Babylon indicates that some knowledge of the principles of electricity must have existed in antiquity. Electrical devices may explain reports of ancient devotees of mysterious flashes of light coming from the eyes of statues you know, of Isis in the temple of Karnak, for example. Indeed, many classical authors have made statements in their work works testifying to the reality of ever burning lamps in ancient times okay and there's a list down here of examples of possible things from ancient uh, historians talking about things that could be depicted as electricity so let's go into some of these right here I'll just jump over to another article before I jump into this I just get the council of nine out of the way I'll be back in a second I'll just get the article Okay, so here we are back with the Council of Nine. We'll take a little intermission here, like they used to have back in the days of the theatres, and we'll just have a very brief look at the the Nine Unknown. Okay, so the the this isn't a very good example, actually. I've brought up a couple here. So let's have a look at this right here. So the Nine Unknown Men were basically a secret society, and this is related to someone called Ashoka. And that's right there. Ashoka was actually uh, a king or emperor back in ancient uh, India. India, of course, is a civilization that no one really knows how old it is. Literally, when rivers that have been around for hundreds of years, no one's seen them actually depleted, actually come down from a very strange drought, you find ancient lotuses carved into rocks 
and beautiful design. Look them up. Maybe I'll talk about them in another video. Or when the waters recede because of some kind of like earthquake, you know, warping up a tsunami offshore, what you see is you see ancient ruins just just barely visible coming out of the sand far off the coast. I mean, India is indeed one of the most ancient places itself. And like I was just going into the sand scripts there of the ancient nuclear weapons. We'll touch on those again, that one as well, just very briefly. I don't want to go too far into this, but the unknown and uh, unknown men basically were a secret society constructed uh, by Ashoka here, who was an emperor after a brutal war. This is how it goes in. People say this is what happened, but try to find some early examples from Indian history, early scholars, or someone writing about it. But hey, you know what? A secret society could probably take care of that. First uh, encounters, like I said, where it seemed to be an invention novels, so maybe feeding off the myth into writing by uh, individuals. I can't remember his name. He was an Indian policeman who wrote about it in the early 1920s. Uh, Tablot uh, Monday was his name. And he wrote these adventure novels and things like that. So he might have been inspired with the myths around India. But so, you know, these people were the equivalent of the Majestic 12. They were charged with hiding information of high technology from the public and secretly studying it. That was their job. The emperor there, uh, Shokai, actually what he did is he got apparently nine of the most smartest people in all of India and he brought them together in a secret society that apparently is still happening today because when one of the members dies and there's always just nine that hit it, another person is appointed into that role just like you would replace a pope, you know, in the Vatican. Okay, so what you have here is you have that, and, and indeed, these people are all around the world, it said scattered. These nine unknown men still around today, even after thousands of years. They control nine books. Each one of those books is a secret school of information, one of them being dedicated to the Sanskrit writings of the Vamanas and things of that nature, which I talked about some of that with the Sanskrit writings early on. I don't know if I've talked about the Sanskrit writings in this video. I've definitely talked about the nuclear weapons and the Sanskrit writings in a video on Patreon before though. Uh, although that would have been... I don't even know where that is anymore. So there you just get the methodology. The same kinds of groups of people throughout society. If this is real and it doesn't need to be, this could be a complete myth that wouldn't make any difference. They would do it anyway. They conspire all the time. People conspire non-stop. You don't even need to have a nine unknown men ruling over at least uh, intellectual property there. So these are the nine books here. One, number one, we'll go very briefly here. Book one to one, number one, which were these schools of thought that they dedicated themselves from ancient times and apparently still around today. Book number one was Propaganda and Psychological Warfare. Of course, these are modern interpretations of these books, <coughs> if the books existed. Physiology was one book. Another one was microbiology. So you might look at that and you might think, microbiology didn't exist 2,000 years ago. But what was seen as a modern ledge, so what they mean is studying the small or something like that. Alchemy, communication, including extraterrestrial. Okay, I'm not saying this is real. I'm just saying this is really this. Gravitation, cosmology, light and sociology, etc. And you also have... Uh, etc. all of that. And here is Ashoka from a back in the days. He is legitimately known as a real entity in history. As for the uh, nine unknown or the nine men, not so much. Not so much at all. Okay. So let's have a look at some examples here of ancient electricity here uh, as written by scholars throughout history. And these are different quotes or different people talking about these uh, this technology from back in the days. Here you have the second emperor of Rome. The stated has had a perpetual light shining in his dome of his temple. I don't know about that kind of stuff. You know, I don't know about it at all. Okay. For instance, look, I'm critical and skeptical of everything. Okay. The one that's most interesting to me is the Egyptians because... How would they, even oil lamps emit some kind of flame, right? The only thing that doesn't emit some kind of carbon flame 
is alcohol. So if they could distill the alcohol into a purity, I'm talking about in the ancient past, they could, they could put a wick on it, they could make an alcohol flame, you know, derived from eth ethanol equivalent, and then they would have a literal flame that had, doesn't have any burns clean. But did they have those capabilities? Maybe. Modern civilization, of course, the, the people that run everything today would say absolutely not. They didn't know, have any of that kind of stuff. So, so the second uh, king of Rome was a uh, perpetual light shining in the dome of the temple. Well, let's face it, you could do that with mirrors. Okay, and, and optics and, you know, a candle in a different direction or, high, you know, a, a big flame burning, you know, and the distance from you to the top of the dome would mean you wouldn't hear the flame. So, you know, not the not not that interesting there. This is this person uh, said that a rote of a lamp which burned at the entrance of the Temple of Jupiter and its priests claim that it had uh, remained alight for centuries don't know. Lucian here, the Greek satirist, gave a detailed account of his travels, etc. in Syria. He said he seen a shining jewel in the forehead of the goddess Hera there, which glowed brilliantly and illuminated the whole temple at night. That is from 120 AD. That is interesting. Of course, you there was the great lighthouse of Alexandria. Okay, so back in the days, okay, they actually had technology that, again, there would have been a different world, right? You had many wonders. In the same locale as the temple of Hadad of Jupiter, probably pronouncing that wrong, etc., provided another type of lightning, glowing stones, a beautiful lamp in the temple. And this is actually the uh, goddess there that has the owl on it, okay, which could burn for a year was described. Okay, this is actually the modern day equivalent of what was apparently based on the Statue of Liberty there. The owl, of course, is apparently wisdom, although the modern depiction through the occult is just a facade of that. Saint Augustine, Augusta, can't pronounce it, left a description of a wonder lamp in one of his works. It was located in Egypt in the temple dedicated to Isis. Saint Augustus, uh, Augustine say, says that neither wind nor water could uh, extinguish it. It was 350 AD. So that's interesting. That does, that's kind of like electricity, right? Or an electrical lamp. So what is an electrical lamp anyway? Well, it's a, a number of Baghdad batteries, if you could get enough of them, put through a very thin wire, right? So it heats up a filament and that kind of makes it glow. Okay, so is it impossible to think that they had the Baghdad batteries, they just had one of them and they didn't daisy chain them together? So here's another ever-burning flame. I won't go through any of them. During the Middle Ages, a third century potential lamp could be found in England and it had burned for several centuries. Okay, so there's other ones again here. So um, let's just um, keep on going here and I won't go through all of them actually. So we'll just have a quick look through this. Technology of ancient e India, zinc powder, wet sawdust, earthen pot, this, I believe, is from the um, the writings of the princess or something, which I could never find yeah, any information on the Indian princess's library um, myself. I couldn't find there. Obviously, there's a lot of translations, but here it is here anyway. It's another version of the battery in ancient writings. Place, a well, and this is the description of how to create it. Well-cleaned copper plate in an earthenware vessel. Cover it first with copper sulfate and then by moist sawdust. After that, put a mercury, amalgate, zinc sheet on top of the sawdust to avoid polarization. The contact will produce energy known in the twin name of Mil Milcha. I don't even know how to say that. Water will be split by this current, etc. A chain of 100 jars is said to give a very active and effective force. I've read about this before. I haven't been able to place it. So, you know, a grain of salt on that one, though. Very, very interesting. Now, let's just cover, okay, because this article's long, let's cover those ancient weapons here. 
from the ancient Sanskrit here, the Mahabharat, okay, the Mahabharat, and this is one of the depictions here, and I'll read it uh, from here, and then we'll go into the comment section. So this individual, flying a swift and powerful Vimana, hurled a single projectile charged with the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose with all its splendor. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a giant messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of these individuals here. The corpses were so burnt as to be unrecognizable. Hair and nails fell out, pottery broke without apparent cause, and birds turned white. What could make a bird turn white? Well, ash. Okay. And what would make hair and nails fall out? Well, radiation. Okay. And here we keep on going. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from the fire, the soldiers threw themselves into the stream to wash themselves and their equipment. So this uh, story is said to be, is said to be down below, over 24,000 years old. Indians believe their history goes back, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or whatever. You know, and, you know, maybe, maybe. The Sphinx itself and the erosion damage from the Sphinx, the Egyptian Sphinx, shows that it was actually in a more tropical period at one stage. And this is coming from a geologist. I can't remember his name is. I just commented on him uh, a few months ago in regards to uh, plasma. Peter Strat, no, I can't remember his name. Peter Strzok's the FBI agent. <clears throat> but anyway, as he, as he went on in that famous uh, Child and Heston documentary was on the Sphinx itself and the erosion damage. If you want to look that up on YouTube, just of course type in Child and Heston Sphinx uh, erosion damage and it'll probably pull it up there. Okay, so let's, what do you think about that? Does that kind of like a nuclear weapon? I don't know. Here's some other examples. If we just go into these very quickly, uh, and these are different weapons. So powerful, and this is the weapon here, that it could destroy the earth in an instant, a glowing, soaring sound and smoke and flames, and on it, it sits death. Okay. Another one, dense arrows of flame like a great shower issued forth upon creation, encompassing the enemy. A thick gloom swiftly settled, etc., on the hosts. All points of the compass were lost in darkness. Fierce wind began to blow upward, showering dust and gravel. Sounds like a, an ex, maybe not a nuclear explosion, but a type of explosion. Another weapon here, and these are in the same text. Birds croaked madly. The very elements seemed disturbed. The earth shook, scorched by a terrible violent heat of this weapon. Elephants burst into flame and ran to and fro in a frenzy. Now what's interesting is if you're writing this, the kind of writing of things that you would think that just kind of like describe a super war. Remember, according to, our, according to historians, the Indians fought with just basic weaponry, depending on what uh, decade or what era they were in. Uh, they didn't have access to super weapons. So this happened over a vast area. Other animals crumpled to the ground and died. From all points of the compass, the arrows and flames rained continuously and fearless, fearlessly. And that again is from the Mahabharat. Okay. And you can, uh, you can always find these articles, okay. If you want to find this, just type in ancient weapons of mass destruction, etc. And you will pull it up. Let's go to the comments section. I'll be back one second. Okay, so here we are in the comments section back again after my video, Western Humans Are Changing. Okay, here is Beck talking about, Hi Ed, thanks for covering the topic. It is very scary to see what is happening to humans because of the reckless use of hormone disrupting chemicals. Girls are getting their first um, menstrual cycles, I guess, at y as young as eight. I know that's just insane, isn't it? Uh, this is not okay, and men are looking more masculine, masculine but sounding more feminine. No wonder they are so confused. Again, here Beck saying, regarding the digital assistant uh, assault online, every time I start watching your videos, I get assaulted by an ad for Guns and Glory with fake gunfire that is very loud. I don't play any of these types of games. 
I am sorry, but I can't watch it though, so you don't get paid too much of an ass assault on my senses. Hence, I'm a patron. Thanks for the interesting comment. You don't have to watch those. Uh, just use an ad block. It doesn't doesn't insult me. Plus, you're all supporting me here. So, what difference does it make? Just install an ad block into Google Chrome. Yes, I mean the ads are so intrusive now. I, you know, I can't look. I can't surf the internet most of the time now. Um, and they get past the ad blocker. That's what's so surprising to me. Like I'll be on a site and then a video will start playing and I've got an ad blocker installed. Well the ad blocker company sold out, that's what happened. They've got whitelisting on their ad block program so they can't even block it anyway. It's like living in a, in a labyrinth, mirror world labyrinth. Thank you Bex. Here is Renee here. Thanks, X for all you uh, thanks Ed for all you do. Most of us can't take the time to dig up all these articles and evidence of what's really going on in the world. It's like living in the twilight zone and it's beyond despicable what they are doing to all us all of us. They gave us clues about what they were up to in books and film, but they don't bother telling us we needed to collect these clues and put them together. It just feels like it's all too late now to change anything back to the way it's supposed to be. You're a good person, Ed. Take care. Thank you, Renee. It is a bit overwhelming sometimes, um, but uh, what can, you know, I don't know what to say. Change is always possible. Something might happen and things might change. Um, they did give you all the clues and gave us all the clues and all slight mentions of them because that's because we're run by a bunch of occultists who believe in lesser magic. They believe in telling, if they tell you their plan beforehand and then they do it to you, then it's your fault that you let it happen to you because you didn't, weren't intelligent enough to see the pattern. So therefore, the karma falls on you and doesn't fall back on them. <sighs> They're sick, okay. They're twisted and sick people. Gilead here. Gilead. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm looking forward to the story. It's not just hormones in our food and water, it's baby formula also. I have noticed a vast difference between formula infants and bre uh, breastfed infants. Boys raised on formula are bigger and more angry and seemingly lack empathy. Same for girls. Formula babies aren't just missing out on antibodies and vi vital nutrients. When they are fed from a bottle, they're missing out on the spirit passed from mother to child. I've actually read articles that showed that, I think it was this, I can't remember now, but uh, children that are breastfed by their mothers are not only more healthy, but they're more intelligent. Okay, They have got everyone at every single different level. It's kind of amazing now. It's everywhere you look, there is, you know, so, it's like you lift up some piece of carpet, there's something wicked underneath it. I mean, it's just... It's unbelievable these days. It's crazy. Then to top it off, okay, I believe that though spirit passed from mother to child, a child needs her mother's milk, obviously. Then it's it's like it just goes through the ages. It's something completely, um, you know. There's some. It's a mother nursing their baby. It's just so. That's what it's about, really. Then to top it all off, before our children can even walk, we're back to the grindstone, leaving them in the filthy hands of society. There, they remain until the cycle repeats. I'm not saying formula is the devil. I understand women, women just can't produce milk, no matter how hard they try. But most do take the easier route and just pop a bottle up to the lips of the young and walk away to snap the perfect selfie. <laughs> that is today's society. <laughs> I have this one friend who actually thought it was weird and gross to even think of breastfeeding an infant. <laughs> the programming is real, hashtag. I was at a loss for words. <laughs> I couldn't believe the most natural thing was weird to the majority of women I knew. Okay, before I go any further, you might be aware of the article if you don't believe me. If you don't believe me and think I'm crazy, I'm going to go get that article right now, okay? <laughs> there was an article came out, I commented on at the time, where they're recategorizing breastfeeding, stating that it was unnatural. I'm not joking. I will go get the article right now. No one believes me, you see, because it's so crazy in Mirror World when I say this stuff. 
Okay, I'll be back soon. Okay, here's the article from Slate. Back in 2016, we need to stop calling breastfeeding natural. This was caused by a recent paper and it published in Pediatrics by bioethics individuals, probably from grievance studies. They say the term is dangerous and also could lead to transphobic behavior. This is the world we live in now. A baby being breastfed by her, him or her's mother is absolutely natural. It is what we're designed to do as a baby. <laughs> well, but, you know, like, like, um, like was, what was said, I mean, you know, you have the sympathy for mothers who cannot produce milk. Obviously, you've got to feed your baby other things, right? There's no doubt about that. You've got to go with what you have. But for the most part, obviously breastfeeding a baby, how is that unnatural? Well, it is in the world of social justice warriors. Okay, so let's head back here. Okay, I just had to get the article. And that is based on the Journal of Pediatrics. There's many articles about the same thing, including Tucker Carlson who talked about it. And you've probably all seen it. Okay, you've probably all seen it. Full disclosure, I breastfed my son for just over 16 months. It was difficult for sure, but nothing compares. I do hope for the, I do have hope for this world. The game hasn't been won yet. Well, also note, I think that when you breastfeed the child, maybe, I think I've read this somewhere, a stronger gro bond grows between the child and their parents, their mother. Like a really strong bond. Like, you know, obviously it's a, just a... A really uh, amazing thing. Life is amazing in general. Can you think of the miracle of being able to create a baby in your womb? It's amazing. You're creating a life force, weaving it, weaving it out of nothing. Okay, and then it has a soul and all these things. This is always uh, amazing to me. I think I've missed some comments here. No, I haven't missed any comments. Usually there's a load more comments button there. I thought there was another comment here. No. Is there a load load comment? No, there's not. Okay, well, a bit of longer video than normal. I try to keep these not too long so they're not too boring. Okay, so we went all over the place. We went everything from the the uh, nine unknown in India to the ancient Sanskrit there with nuclear weapons to bad dag batteries. And we even touched on the corruption of the Egyptian antiquity department as well as the Sphinx and all types of things. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you so much for your support. It makes all this possible from Mirror World. It keeps this broadcast alive. In the meantime, I'll see you all tomorrow on the channel if you're watching on there. And I have some more stories coming up early in the morning. I do schedule stories as well as I post ones through the day. So I've got some interesting ones tomorrow. Um, and so you'll see those. In the meantime, go out and decide for yourselves, of course. This is all wild speculation as far as ancient electricity, <laughs> okay? I don't know, there just seems to be a lot of signs of it everywhere. Go out to your own research, decide for yourselves. Thank you for your support. But in the meantime, no matter what you do, stay safe. And I'll see you all later.